I actually want to begin uh, today uh, reading for us a poem. Uh, it's a poem about suffering, uh, and it's a poem that's called Satan's Teeth. Uh, the words will be up on the screen for you. The pain, the pain, the grief, the grief, the gnawing down of Satan's teeth. Expectations set sky high, not met, then dashed, life quickly passing by. Obedience along the way, the only path, but oh how painful the surging aftermath. Hope for better, just ahead, or just more gnawing, Satan's teeth. I don't know if you kind of get a sense of what that uh, poem is trying to pick up on, the sort of experience, I actually wrote it to try and capture something of my experience. Um, but also, uh, for me, it was uh, reflecting on the, the biblical material as well. You see a figure like Job. Uh, who is handed over to Satan's hand and suffers under his hand. E even a couple of weeks ago in Bible study, uh, we were reading that passage uh, where Peter himself uh, is sifted by Satan in his threefold denial of Jesus. And that's actually uh, part of what we're going to be looking at uh, this morning together in the second half of Luke chapter 22. Um, and when you kind of look at that, uh, I mean, even that temptation of Peter, I mean, he He'd stood by Jesus and here he is, he denies him. Uh, everything that he'd hoped for uh, with Jesus, it's all kind of turning to, to nothing. And, and I can't say that I've, I've suffered uh, like Peter, but I do know something of pain. And I'm pretty sure that uh, many of you here today know something of pain as well. Uh, when I think back uh, before uh, Jay and I moved up to Mackay to plant this church, we went along to uh, church planning conferences. Uh, and often at these conferences, there would be this uh, segment where they'd get a church planner up to share something of their experience. Most of the time they'd end in uh, tears. Uh, it kind of got a particular name, this segment, because the person would always end in tears. But you kind of, you, you saw something of the anguish uh, that these people had been through as they got up uh, to share. And I think for, uh, the idea was that for these young people going to uh, plant churches and be ministers of, of churches, the idea was to get a bit of a, a feel for what you were headed for. Um, Jay and I, we were young, we are energetic, thought, how hard can it be? Uh, but I think as you kind of look back on it, we, we've got a bit more of an idea now. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure that you guys have probably got a little bit more insight about some of the difficulties that life might throw at you as well uh, at the point that you're at, whether it's uh, with work, uh, challenges that you found at work, whether it's challenges that you had even finding work. Uh, maybe it was challenges to do with marriage, wanting to be married, or, or maybe uh, you became married and, and you found challenges within marriage that you maybe didn't expect, uh, challenges bringing up kids, and a bunch of us are in that uh, kind of zone. There can be health challenges, there can be relational challenges, financial, spiritual, emotional. And in our Bible study group a couple of weeks ago, we were kind of having this discussion about how in the good times you can have all sorts of um, bold ambitions. Uh, can I ever even say things like Peter said to Jesus that I'll, I'll never deny you, Jesus. Whatever you want me to do, uh, I'll do it. And yet uh, when the Christian person can kind of get into that season of suffering, uh, sometimes all they can think about is, take it away, God. Take it away. I don't want to be here. And, and this uh, term at Make, we've been working through our series in Luke's Gospel, Passion and Peace. Uh, hopefully you've picked up that idea that uh, before there can be peace, there must be passion. And I think that's really a, a fair principle for life. If I can put it this way, uh, pain has a purpose. Uh, as we go through uh, even doing something like exercise, it's painful, uh, but it bears good fruit. It, it brings fitness and, and health and that type of thing. Uh, the same thing, Jesus dies on the cross, it brings this wonderful fruit of peace and joy. Uh, and likewise, uh, for many of us, we probably have that sense that there will be difficulty. If we want to live a, a life of peace, uh, a life of joy, uh, there will be difficulty along the way. But I want to ask the question this morning, what do we actually do with that pain that we feel as we go through the difficult seasons? How do we keep going through that? Uh, what does the Christian person do in the midst of pain when all they want God to do is take it away, when they may be struggling uh, to do the very thing that they know God wants them to do? What, what do you do uh, in that season? Uh, well, let's pray as we come to look at God's Word together. Let's pray. Loving mean, Father, we uh, do just thank you that you speak to us, uh, that you speak to us uh, in ways that's relevant for all sorts of different uh, times of life. And Lord, we just pray for your mercy this morning as we think about kind of the more difficult times of life, Lord, that you would just give us insight 
Uh, Father, that you'd help us to know you in the midst of those kind of experiences. Uh, and we just pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, in this series, Passion and Peace, we're, we're really getting to that point in the gospel where uh, we're beginning to see, or we get to see the start of Jesus' passion, the end of uh, Luke chapter 22. We'll look at the first part of uh, the passion of Christ today. We'll come back in a few weeks' time to look at the second part of that. Uh, but really for Jesus, this point, uh, there was kind of that high point, uh, just fleeting as he had the, the Passover meal with his disciples. He was excited about that. Uh, but as he gets up and goes and prays, uh, we see that it, it's, it's not such a happy time for him. If you've got uh, Luke 22 open, I'm looking at verse 41. It said, He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, beyond the disciples, and this is Jesus. Uh, he knelt down and he prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, and yet not my will, but yours be done. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, the verses that follow there, verses 43, 44, that speak about Jesus praying and kind of sweating like drops of blood, uh, most likely those verses aren't actually part of the original text. If you've got the um, NIV, there's a little note at the end of verse 44 saying that the earliest manuscripts don't actually have those verses. Um, they're kind of verses that we uh, maybe associate very closely with that event as Jesus prays in the garden. Um, it, Seems that maybe there was some verbal tradition that the copyists have uh, folded into the text at some later time. Uh, but, but as you look at this um, prayer that Jesus prays, on, on one level it's consoling for us. I mean, he prays uh, to the Father, if you're willing, uh, take this cup from me. And of course, that language of the cup from the Old Testament, it's talking about the cup of God's wrath, uh, his judgment. Jesus uh, prays that God would take that away. But, it, but it's quite an emotional scene. Um, as you look at what Jesus is praying here, that Jesus would even pray this prayer. I mean, Jesus has known for quite a while uh, what he's heading towards. I mean, even uh, if you just flick back a couple of chapters in Luke to chapter 18, verse 31, for the third time, uh, Jesus predicted clearly to his disciples that he was going to suffer. Uh, chapter 18, verse 31, Jesus took the twelve aside, he told them, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man must be fulfilled. He will be delivered. Over the Gentiles, they'll mock him, insult him, spit on him, and they'll flog him and kill him. Um, and on the third day, he'll rise again. Jesus knew uh, what it was that he was walking towards, and yet here in the garden, he prays that it be taken away. And you've got to think about that. This is, this is Jesus who loves God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is Jesus who wants to do the will of God, um, and yet still he prays at this point, in the midst of his pain, Father, take it away. I mean, we know that Jesus is God, um, and that means that there is, there is one will in God. Uh, Jesus has one will uh, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and yet we also see in this verse that he has his own separate will. Uh, the Son is also a distinct person from the other two, and at this point, in the midst of his suffering, uh, his individual will is kind of torn against this will of God that sits with him in him as well. I mean, it's kind of a mystery beyond us even understanding. But do you see something of the pain at that point that Jesus is going through? Of course, it gets worse as you read through the chapter. I mean, uh, it, it's interesting as you read on, we, we don't really get to see the internal uh, struggle going on for Jesus. He's obedient uh, as he walks to the cross. And I think oftentimes when people are obedient to God in the various situations they go through in life, you don't so much get to see what's going on under the surface for them. But just, just look as we read through it and think about what was this suffering and this pain actually like for Jesus? Verse 47. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you going to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And here's Judas that, that Jesus has actually personally picked out to be part of his 12 disciples. He's lived and, and eaten and, and spent life with him intensively for three years. He has loved Judas. Judas has been with him through the, the ups and the downs. He's seen the miracles, he's seen the great crowds gathering around Christ, and yet at the same time he's seen other disciples turn their backs on Jesus. He's seen what the religious leaders have done to Jesus, and yet here comes Judas, this one who knows what Jesus has been through, and he comes leading the crowd against him. 
Uh, the, the high priests, the religious leaders, the, the guards, kind of like the police, if you like, uh, and the civil leaders, the, the elders. He brings them to Jesus. And, and you kind of get a hint of Jesus' pain at this moment, as in verse 48 there, you see him recoil as, as Judas leans out to kiss him. Uh, Jesus kind of asks him, are you really going to use this sign of affection for me, Judas, as the indication uh, that the crowd can come and take me away to this suffering that I'm going to go to. It's, it's a terrible point for Jesus. And it is, a, as this crowd comes, it's a, it's a fight or flight kind of moment. The disciples, uh, they choose to fight. Initially, Peter brings out his sword. We know it's Peter from one of the other Gospels, cuts off uh, the high priest's ear. But we see Jesus being obedient. He loves his enemies. He reaches out for this high priest servant and heals him. Uh, but for Jesus, the suffering continues. Now, as you keep working through the passage there from verse 54, uh, I mean, Jesus has predicted that um, Peter uh, would deny him three times, and, and it happens, and, and Jesus actually gets to see it happen, we're told, in this text. First, Peter, he's standing around a fire, he denies Jesus to a, to a servant girl, a young servant girl, then to two others. And we're told at that point, after that third denial, the rooster crows, verse 61 the Lord turned and he looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word that the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Just think what that was like for Jesus as he looked out, he was in the high priest's house, he looks out and he, and he catches Peter's eye. He knows what's happened because he predicted that it would happen, that Peter would deny him. And yet he sees Peter at that moment, this kind of sheepish look on his face. He sees Peter crumple at the realisation that he's done the very thing that Jesus said he would and then turn his back and walk out. I mean, for, for Jesus at that point, that's, that's three years' worth of ministry. His disciples, these people that he's invested in and tried to build up, this was his work. And at that moment, it's, it's all gone to ashes. There's none left. Peter, his strongest, most resolute disciple, turns his back and goes and weeps. And I think as you kind of look at this picture of what Jesus went through, if we say nothing else from it, we've got to say that, that whatever you might be experiencing now, maybe whatever you've experienced in the past, whatever uh, you have in front of you, Jesus has been there. Uh, he knows your pain. I mean, if you've had the experience of working and labouring hard for some outcome and you've seen it all turn to nothing, Jesus knows that pain. Uh, if there's been someone that you've cared for, that you've invested in, that you had high hopes for, and then had them turn their back on you or kind of just walk away from it all, Jesus knows that pain. And as you keep reading through the chapter, I think really Jesus' experience, it goes beyond uh, anything that, that most of us, I imagine, in this room have even uh, seen or, or experienced. Verse 63, the men who were guarding Jesus, they began mocking and beating him. Uh, they blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy who hit you. And they said many other insulting things to him. Here's Jesus. He is God himself. He knows who he is and how great he is. And, and yet here he is being mocked and, and torn down, uh, insulted. And the chapter closes out with this kind of mock courtroom scene. Uh, there's no justice for Jesus. The very uh, ones who are passing judgment on him are the ones who wanted him dead in the first place. I and mean, Jesus is utterly alone. He is utterly abandoned. He is helpless without aid. And, and this is only the beginning of it. We'll come back in a couple of weeks' time and look at the end uh, of Jesus' sufferings in the midst of the Passion. We've got to see here that whatever you are experiencing, whatever pain you are feeling, Jesus knows it. Jesus has been there. He understands. A couple of weeks ago, I was uh, chatting to uh, a person who'd been through cancer, a cancer sufferer. They'd had surgery uh, they'd been through the various treatments, kind of radiotherapy and whatnot, and they'd, and they'd come through uh, cancer. Praise God. 
And yet as I was talking to this person, uh, they were describing the experience, even after they'd been through all this, all the surgery, everything else, of the, the experience of kind of living their life in six-week blocks. They'd have a scan, uh, get told that you're clear of cancer, come back in six weeks and we'll, we'll check it over again. So you live for six weeks in kind of this hope, I don't have cancer, six weeks' time you could very well have it returned again. I just said to this person, I... I can't imagine what that's like. I can't understand that. Uh, are there other people that you can talk to who have been through this experience, going through this experience? And, and, and the person kind of looked at me and said, yeah, yeah, there's, there's others, there's plenty of other cancer sufferers out there. They, uh, they understand. And he kind of made the comment that as he's around those other cancer sufferers, that, that they just kind of know. They don't even really have to share their experience. They just, they, they know uh, what they're going through, what they've been through, what it's like. Powerful experience, I think. You could see the relief uh, to have uh, those who, who knew. My friends, I want to put to us that, that Jesus knows. And what do we do when we're walking through pain? How do, how do we get through those difficult seasons in life? Well, I think we need to realise that Jesus, he's, he's been there, he understands. And we need to actually turn to him. We need to bring our pain to this one who understands us, who knows what we're going through. Uh, to pray to him, maybe, a similar prayer that he prayed, Lord, take, uh, take this pain away. We're allowed to pray that prayer. It's a wonderful prayer. Uh, but of course, we've got to pray the second part, don't we? Uh, not my will, but your will be done. And yet, as I, I think as we come to Jesus, this one who understands our pain, I, I think there's an even uh, better prayer uh, that we can be praying. As you look at this uh, chapter, Luke 22, we can be a little bit hard on the disciples sometimes. I think even that uh, scene back where Jesus is praying and the disciples fall asleep uh, in chapter 22, verse 45. You can think of the disciples, what were they doing? I mean, the Christian might understand the experience of praying and kind of falling asleep in the middle of praying. It's kind of a common thing to happen. But I mean, the disciples, it's this pinnacle moment in history. I mean, they're out in the cold. Surely that would have at least kept them awake. But they're asleep. And, and, and though we might be harsh on them, Luke is not. You see the little comment he makes at the end of verse 45? Uh, Jesus comes, he finds them asleep, uh, and Luke explains it to us at the end of verse 45. They were exhausted from sorrow. And the disciples' suffering, I don't, I don't think we can say that it was as great as Jesus, but it was, it was difficult for them. I mean, to see this man that they had given up three years of their life for, that they had all these hopes of what he was going to do and what that would mean for them and their lives, and to see it come to this, and sorrow. They are so consumed with sorrow that all they can do is escape into sleep. That is the only way forward that they know. But Jesus actually has some advice for them in the midst of their pain. And there, sorry, it's advice that he repeats twice uh, in this passage, verse 40. He repeats it again, verse 46. See it at the end of verse 40. Pray that you will not fall into temptation. Verse 46, end of the verse again. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. I think as we come to the one who understands our pain, it's a, it's a wonderful prayer, isn't it? So we're in the um, midst of pain. <laughs> Often, often we want to do whatever we can to get rid of that pain. We like to take control of the situation however we can. We, we want to make whatever choice is going to minimise that pain. But instead, Jesus says, what we need to be praying in that moment is, Lord, keep me from temptation. Lord, keep me submitting my will to your will. Keep me trusting you. Lord, keep me from temptation. Uh, for those of you here last week, we had that uh, God at Work segment that we've kind of uh, been kicking off, and we had Michelle share with us about what she's been learning about prayer. Uh, I thought it was powerful as she described uh, that experience of realising that maybe in the midst of some of her difficulty, um, she's come to the realisation that sometimes she needs to stop thinking. We need to think, but sometimes there's a point where she actually needs to stop thinking and actually turn and just, and just pray, put it before God. I think that's a, a wonderful uh, description of something that could be very helpful for all of us. I found it very helpful. But, but you might have wondered at that point, well, what do I pray? What do I go and pray at that point? Jesus tells us here, Lord, keep me from temptation. Keep me from temptation. Um, 
You might hear some people who uh, kind of want to talk about the fact that God doesn't exist and they'll kind of use that philosophical argument that uh, God uh, cannot be all good and all powerful. That's not possible for him to be both. Either he's all powerful but he's not good enough to actually step in and stop suffering or he's all good but he can't actually do anything about the suffering that we're going through. And so there's this kind of philosophical argument that people have put through to say there is no all good, all powerful God out there. And of course, that kind of philosophical reasoning, it fails to uh, grapple with the fact that God might actually have a good reason um, for the suffering that we're going through. Uh, We need to actually wrestle that through. And I think that's kind of part of the picture that the Bible gives to us. But I think for the Christian person, as they go through suffering, they might not kind of wholesale buy into that kind of thinking, but I think there can be the temptation um, to at least act as if it's partly true. The Christian goes through suffering. I think oftentimes they they know that God's sovereign, might be the language that they use. They know that God's all-powerful. They know that God could step in and do something, and so they maybe pray that he would, like Jesus does in this passage. But if if they don't see God answer that prayer, it can begin to sow seeds of doubt that God is actually good and for us. And that can make us feel less willing to actually go to God in prayer. Uh, It can make us less willing to actually do the things that we know God wants us to do in this situation because we kind of wonder, well, God doesn't really get it. He doesn't really understand. We've got to see from this passage that as Jesus walks to the cross, he he, he does get it. He does understand. God has been through the situation. I would put it to us that if we could truly understand what Jesus went through, it's actually a lot worse. But he's good. There, There was purpose in it. And Jesus shows us the way through this simple prayer Sometimes it's probably all we can manage. Lord, keep me from temptation. We began this morning asking that question, what what do we uh, do as we walk through seasons of pain and suffering? How do we keep going through that? And we're seeing that partly we need to to understand that whatever you are going through, Jesus gets it. He he does understand. He's there with you. He has been there uh, through that pain. And so we need to turn to him. Turn to this one who understands we need to pray, Lord, keep me from temptation. And I just think, just just imagine that um, you kind of took hold of what this passage is putting before you. I think one of the great difficulties, at least for me, as I go through suffering, is you just, you don't know what you're meant to do. What am I meant to do, Lord, in this situation? Imagine that you took hold of this and you believed it and you thought, well, the one thing that I'm meant to do is just to pray. Pray, Lord, keep me from temptation. We just prayed that simple prayer. That was all that we could manage, but that's all we need to manage. This last week for me, I had a couple of days where I was uh, going through some pain. I kind of thought, well, I've at least got to put into practice what I've got to get up and preach on Sunday. It didn't really feel like praying this prayer, Lord, keep me from temptation, but kind of did it on and off through those two days. It's funny how it changes your perspective as you start praying, Lord, keep me from temptation. I could kind of see even things that I was thinking through from a different perspective that I thought were totally neutral, just different options. I was kind of weighing up for things. Lord, keep me from temptation. Different set of eyes. And and I must say, at the end of a couple of days of that, God just gave me a different perspective on things. Nothing changed on the outside, but suddenly through it. And I don't think necessarily this passage is promising that there's any easy fix. Two days, two weeks, two months. uh, It doesn't say how long it might be. It's a great prayer, Lord, keep us from temptation. Wouldn't it be great uh, for us to be a church that, uh, not that we were excluded from suffering, but a church that actually knew how to walk through suffering together. We knew that our Saviour had been through. We knew how to pray, Lord, keep me from temptation. We knew how to kind of walk through that and model that for the people around us and for each other, to to walk through and go, yeah, I know what you're going through. It's tough. Can't necessarily do a whole lot about it, but let's let's keep praying. Lord, keep us from temptation. Something I've been thinking about lately, um, kind of this hypothetical situation popped into my mind. If 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 I was to move to Mackay all over again to to plant this church, and I could pick anyone in the world to come and be part of this church, to reach out to Mackay, I had this realization. I don't think I'd pick as good a team as God has put for us here at Make. The gifts, the skills, the different demographics uh, that we represent, the hearts for God in our midst. It's kind of this powerful thought, and I think that that is true, and I want to keep thinking about that and communicating that. 
But friends, if we're going to do that, if we're going to reach our town for Christ, we've got to pray. We've got to know how to walk through suffering. And so let's put this into practice. I want to... um, Sorry. (laughs) I want to do something a little bit different as we finish off the, the talk today rather than just going straight into prayer. I want to just give you a couple of moments to just pause and actually to think about the pain that you're going through at the moment. Maybe it's a very small thing. Maybe it's a very significant large thing. Just to give you a bit of time to reflect on that Actually, just to put this into practice straight away, to to actually just pray about it. Lord, keep me from temptation in the midst of this pain. Just going to give you a couple of moments to do that, a couple of minutes, and then I'll lead us in prayer like normal, and we'll open up for question time, and we'll ask questions about the pain that maybe we're going through. Maybe it's just little things in the text that I haven't covered that you'd like to touch on. But could we do that today? Just spend a few moments reflecting, putting this into practice, praying to the one who understands our pain. Lord, keep me from temptation, and then I'll... Uh, lead us in some prayer. So let's take a few moments. Loving Father, we do just come to you and we just we, we thank you for the cross. But we do just thank you that at the cross we, we see uh, what you're really like. We see that you're not a God who's removed from our world, from our experience, but you've, you've walked through this life uh, just like we have. Lord, as we find ourselves going through painful situations, Lord, keep us from temptation. Lord, may it uh, not be our will, but your will. That is done. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.